I, and, but you're so right. And I really never thought of that. That is so true, right? All of a sudden you're like. Hello, podcasting world. And welcome back to another episode of the Core Console RX podcast. Uh, it's sadly today, my co-host Cole Swanson could not be with us. Um, once again, he's really slacking, but uh, he had some work issues come up. So, in his stead, I have my bo- my good buddy uh, Tom sitting in, who is a PA, and uh, he's gonna hopefully share some uh, stories about the PA world. Tom, what's going on, man? Hey, man, how you doing, Mike? Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. This is cool. I'm glad we could do this. We were at a wedding uh, recently, and yeah. we're, we're talking about some of the. Uh, you know, differences in medicine and talking about some, the PA life versus the PharmD life and all that stuff. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to kind of hearing your story. Me too. Me too. Um, we met, what, doing CrossFit? Yeah, man. Yeah. Yeah. Back yeah. in uh, like 2014. Yeah. You were still in school, right? Yeah. Well, that's right. I was. I was yeah. a fourth year in uh, pharmacy school then. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so, uh, yeah. So you saw me back when I was a student and didn't yeah. know nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And we both quit. Around the same time. Yeah, we yeah. decided that Cheetos were better. <laughs> yeah, for sure, for sure. So you kind of take us back. Like before you were a PA, you had a pretty interesting career. And this is kind of one of the things that we kind of bonded over right off the bat. Um, because like with me, with the mixed martial arts, like I fought professionally kind of before and during pharmacy school. Yes. So what about you? What uh, what did you do that was a little different than the normal story? Um, so I uh, played football, went to college for football mainly. And I actually wanted to be a physical therapy major. And at our orientation um, for PTs my freshman year of college, it was done with the PAs, physician assistants. And I asked the girl sitting next to me, I was like, what's a PA? And she told me, I was like, that's what I want to do. Because I knew I wanted to be in medicine, but physical therapy was the only thing I really knew that wasn't med school. You know, I knew I didn't want to go through med school, but once I found about PA... So I went to school and I started and, um, you know, your, my first few years, I didn't do what I should have done, you know, um, hanging out too much instead of going to the library and studying. Um, and then I started doing um, bodybuilding and that really changed the way I, um, I kind of looked at everything, you know, because when you do bodybuilding, um, you have to eat seven times a day. It's got to be two to three hours apart. So and you can't go out, you can't have fun, you can't stray from that diet at all if you want to not look like a blob on stage. Um, so that really, you know, when I ha- I would eat and then had nothing to do, so I would go to the library and my grades went up real high. <laughs> so I I actually got so I was in the PA major. I got dropped out because I was doing bad my first few years, and then I re- realized that I got to do something with my life and I better get it together. So I started studying real hard and I actually got back into the PA program that I got to drop out of and the rest is history. That's awesome, man. Yeah. What got you? So you were in PA school whenever you started doing the bodybuilding stuff? Um, so I um, was in undergrad. Okay. And I started doing the bodybuilding thing. Um, and that kind of gave me the discipline to, you know, study and actually put my mind to stuff. And so I was in undergrad, but I was a PA major the whole time. So you were like on that PA track, mm-hmm. I was but doing you were just the in the under- Gotcha, gotcha. And then um, I did bodybuilding, though, through PA school. And actually, the best grades I got when I was in actual PA graduate school was when I was doing the bodybuilding thing. Because, I, I mean, you pretty much have nothing else to do besides eat and work out. And you're so regimented that it's just so easy to kind of put, you know, okay, for this three-hour block, I'm going to study. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did some shows and I won, um, I won like the New York state uh, championships, heavyweight division. And then I won the new England's heavyweight division, natural bodybuilding. And I loved it and I was doing real well, but I saw that really the only way to make good money was to basically go to NPC bodybuilding, which is the non-tested. <laughs> and I didn't want to fill my body up with all those drugs. Where you become a freak beast. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, it would look cool, of yeah, course. Yeah, of course. But no I judgment. well aware of the damage yeah, done. Right. And I don't want to screw with my body like that, especially at a young age. That's um, the unfortunate part of uh, having the medical background. Yeah. when you Because I, I saw you know some of the steroid stuff as well whenever I was doing MMA, and it's like, ugh. Yeah, you, know, you, you see these guys having a heart attacks such a young age. Yeah, it's rough to see. You know, and 
that's the problem because so many kids out there they don't realize once you start injecting a endogenous hormone in your body you pretty much unless you know screw up your body's hormone production for life mm-hmm. because no one ever uses steroids for a few months and never touches it again right it becomes that like five ten year thing where you just can't get off it or when you do and your body's never the same and you pretty much almost push yourself into that when you quit by the time you're 30 your body's so used to getting it that your testicles don't work right and now you have to be on a shot a month or a shot every two weeks because yeah, and just the, endocrine system just done yeah exactly um and people don't realize how much is involved and how many side effects there are so um, well, i knew i didn't want to do that anymore what's your what's your thoughts on uh and like this is totally random off topic but yeah. like, what's your thoughts on um like testosterone replacement therapy in elder like elderly men like even like even like 40 50 year old if they if they have low t yeah you know I don't know how much, how worth it it is. You know, there's no, there's nothing really shown that it's going to really hurt these people, right? I mean, there's no study shown. I mean, I mean, as far as you know. So the, the problem right now is we don't necessarily know. Yeah, right. that's what I've been told. Like, So, you know, it's one of those things we, th- we think that it could potentially increase, like, having the odds of having a cardiovascular event, but we don't know for sure. So, yeah. Ugh. I mean, I guess it's really all due to the person. I can't see it having that much of an effect, you know, one shot every two weeks. And I feel like it just, if it does, it's so easy to just start, oh, I'm going to do a shot every week. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? And then it's just, yeah, the stuff is scary. I mean, it's, I have so many friends who just wanted to dabble and then they just never got off. Got addicted because, to it. Yeah. I mean, you know, and. Once you start, I mean, who doesn't want to feel great, look mm-hmm. great, going to the gym, doing the best they ever done, and all of a sudden you get off it and you're like, oh, you can't barely lift, your body's mm-hmm. falling apart. Yeah. yeah, I think I think from a clinical aspect, it has, especially in like, testosterone replacement, it has to be very, very like patient specific. Um, yeah, looking at for all the sure. different, you know, um, both psychological and uh, you know the variables of cardiovascular risk and all that, but. I was just curious if you'd had much experience with that, like while you were coming up, if you had some guys that had been in it for a long time and, um, you, you know, I think the biggest thing out there is the lacking of education people to help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, you know, like most general practitioners there, you know, if you walk into an office and say, I've been using this amount of steroids for years, I need help getting off of them stuff. Most, you know, they'll be like, well, you just got to stop them. No one's going to give them, you know, Rimadex or mm-hmm. HCG, um, you have to go to special clinics. Only certain doctors will do it. And I think there is a population of people out there who need help, you know, because you just end up using it otherwise because yeah. you, you don't have any professional help. Nobody mm-hmm. knows how the pituitary and hypothalamus affect the testicles. And, mm-hmm. You know, you're just doing what some other guy told you to do and hoping it works. Got the bro science. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the bro science at the max. So um, this is a total aside. Now, I don't think I've ever actually said this on the podcast, but um, I've had done a couple posts about it and stuff on Instagram, but there's a, a treatment option that people are using now for testosterone replacement that's not true testosterone. They're actually using Clomid. Have you seen that yep. um, in males? Mm-hmm. Um, because the uh, the Clomid, which is a fertilization um, a medication used to increase fertilization in females, um, so hopefully allow them to become pregnant, they're using it in older males now because in a male body, it basically increases like your follicle stimulating hormone, your luteinizing hormone, um, and your uh, the male body completely completely like rejects that and it starts really getting your um exogenous testosterone back up again or endogenous rather yeah um and I'll get your endocrine system kind of start back up yeah the clomids are one of the drugs that um a lot of guys take when they get off testosterone mm-hmm. because it'll you know because you're putting testosterone in your body you're shutting down your lh and fsh to tell your testicles to produce testosterone so by taking this it forces your um uh, body to make the LSH and the, uh, LH and FSH yeah. uh, to make the testosterone. But I feel like it ends up being the same thing because mm-hmm. then your body is not, you know, it's not, you're taking the Clomid to tell your body to make those hormones. So once you stop it, now what happens? Right. Your body's not making your own FSH and LH and you end up having low, you know, a- a episode of no testosterone kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, uh, 
Definitely one of those things. It's very patient specific. But if you do see, if you're for the pharmacists that are listening, if you do see a script that comes by for a male for Columbia, don't freak out. <laughs> Especially if it's from a urologist or somebody that they're most likely doing it for. Okay. Um, to increase in, uh, endogenous testosterone levels. I mean, if it's increasing your testosterone, it's a lot easier than a shot, right? It sure is. Who wants to stick themselves with a needle? No so kidding. I'd rather take a pill. Some people do. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Some people love it. Yeah. Some people can't wait to get that shot. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I heard about um, HCG being used for male fertility. Mm-hmm. Is that true? Have you seen guys I, get I, like... I haven't seen too much of it in, like, in fertility practice. I, I don't spend too much time doing that. That's but, true. Um, you know, I, I could be... Uh, so I, I don't want to like give any misinformation, but I'm, I'm sure it's been looked okay. at. Um, I've definitely heard about it in guys using it for performance oh, yeah, enhancement. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I heard it swells them up. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But uh, so I think um, I'd have to do some more research to see where it's being utilized and all that. But yeah. I'm sure it's being looked at for sure. Awesome, awesome. Um, sorry, that was a total yeah. rabbit trail. But all right. um, so back to yeah. Okay. So so you you're doing the PA the uh, the bodybuilding stuff. You go into PA school. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you feel like? if at all, like bodybuilding and like being, a, you know, you started to say about the discipline and stuff like that. Do you feel like that really had an impact, um, on the way you perform as a PA now? Huge. Definitely. Um, you know, I, um, I, I think it was two things. I think it was the discipline that I learned from the bodybuilding the ability to like, you know, you're hungry forever when you're about to go through a show, you're so dehydrated, you would kill for a sip of water and going through that pain and that long-term months of dieting and being hungry all the time, it really teaches you how to deal with the long hours, you know, basically gives you um, just that work ethic that you need. And mm-hmm. then also I was at that point in my life, I think I was 24, 25 when I graduated. So when I started actual graduate PA school, I was ready to, you know, buckle down and stop going out and party. And, you know, cause mm-hmm. I, I just, I realized that it was either that or <laughs> do this bodybuilding thing, you know, right. which would pretty much go nowhere. PA and, is a little, uh, a little more lucrative. Yeah. Yeah. yeah a little safer career. Unless definitely. you're Arnold. <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely. No, that's awesome. Um, you know, one of the things that, uh, I always attribute to, um, I, you know, personally the way I feel that MMA helped me so much as a pharmacist, obviously they have nothing really to do together no, on, the, yeah. on the surface, but, um, you know, going through the training, like you were saying, and then, um, I always think about the weight cuts and I know you did some of those as well. Oh, yeah. Um, anytime, like I have like to stay up for, you know, even now, like if I'm, I'm working in a project where I need to stay up all night yeah. and be at work the next morning and like, I'm tired, I don't feel like doing it. I'm like, you know what? This is so much better than cutting 20 pounds in 24 hours exactly like that's I, I, that's the worst most miserable thing you can ever go through i shouldn't say I would ever go through but for a sport that doesn't matter <laughs> yeah um to Something go you're doing because you like to go through that is miserable yeah and so uh, i remember sitting in the shower just like telling myself do not drink the water do not drink the water like and now, like I, anything that comes up, me and like with pharmacy or anything like that, I'm just like, Damn, it's not that bad, right? I mean, it is anybody who's done that, it is crazy. Like, you think the hunger is bad, and then once you start cutting the water, it the hunger doesn't even come to your mind. You just would literally kill somebody for a sip of water, mm-hmm. like, please. I mean, that's all you want, and that really opens your eyes. And then also, now that I've gone through school, I'm like, what did I do to my kidneys? Yeah. Jesus. I was going to say, <laughs> right? exactly. You're like, oh my gosh. Yeah, I bet if I got some blood work, my creatinine would have been like 2.53. <laughs> I uh, he started uh, just peeing Coca-Cola. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I, I, I always kind of like use that as a disclaimer as I'm like telling that story to like students or if I'm ever telling like a group, I'm like, yeah, just so you know, I'm not advocating yeah. cutting weight. It's really stupid. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> how, how I I did do it because it's part of the game. But. but you were also, though, a professional, right? Mm-hmm. So you were really, I mean. If I didn't make weight, I didn't get paid. Exactly. And that that was your life. And, mm-hmm. and I mean, as a professional, you really, in your mind at the time, you're working, you're a professional, you're getting paid, you're trying to get to the top. I mean, in your head, you weren't saying, like, there's no way I'm never going to make it, right? At the point in time, you so, were saying, yeah, I'm going to go for it. When I first signed on to, like, fight professionally, going from amateur to professional, I literally was saying pharmacy school is a backup plan for me, and I'm just going to do this. I, I get it. it. It wasn't until really, like, kind of having some, uh, going through some fights and realizing that, like, this is such a short-term 
like life expectancy in the, yeah. in the in the game as far as actively fighting and you know i was already 24 20 24 i think at the time which i mean now that, that now i'm 30 from. that's like 108 in mma years right yeah and you know you just can't do it for long your body gives out i still have issues with you know joints and stuff now like big time that i should not have at 30 years old yeah because i did all that and uh you know it's one of those things that i just kind of had to really look in the mirror and be like okay what am i doing like do i really really want this because you have to really really love it and to be honest i started like for me pharmacy school like especially when i hit rotations it yeah. it filled that gap of the competitiveness that i have because okay. I, I need that competitive i know what you and, mean and so like for me like that was easier for me to quit because it, it was like every single rotation i was on, i was like i'm gonna like make it so that every single person that follows me it's just like, oh, no. Yeah. Like, you know, and, you know, and not even in an area. I internalized no, all yeah, that. Yeah. I didn't, like, talk trash to my no, classmates sure. or anything. Yeah. But, but it just filled that, like, you know, if, if there's not a, someone to compete against, I'll just, like, kind of manifest this um, person that I need to compete against <laughs> for the exactly heck of it. what you mean. And yeah. so it was, a, you know, I was able to kind of let it go at that point. But, I mean, honestly, it, it allowed me to I, – I fought somebody to buy my wife's engagement ring. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I – Yeah, you it, were making a so living on was, it. Was, it was fun. I'm super glad that I did it now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right, you're, like you're saying, the experience alone, right? And mm -hmm. it really shows you not only the work ethic but also making a goal setting your mind on it and getting there, right? You're like, okay, I got to be this weight. I got to look like this. You, you're like, I got to be in shape. I got to be this weight and I got to be ready for this fight. And you made it. And how many times did you have to do that? And you kept doing it. So you, I think it not only gives you the work ethic, but the belief in yourself that if I put my mind to it, I could do anything. Yeah, right? exactly. For sure. That's the big thing is like that mental game is so, you can, it's such a, for people who haven't had to go through some, and, and you can do it in all kinds of different ways, different, you know, academic situations, whatever it may be, like having to go. That's why I think residency and stuff is so brutal. It partly is to be like, look, you can, you can do this. Yeah, like right. 40 hour work week is not that big a deal and you can do 80 <laughs> like yeah. if you have to. Yeah. So I think that's the big, uh kind of the big takeaway for me is just the mental edge it gives you doing something like that that's competitive and definitely not encouraging every single person to go out and try fighting but yeah, like no, for yeah. me that's where it was uh, it really helped me now as a as a pharmacist which is weird to say but it did so hey man i think everybody needs to find that thing you mm -hmm. know what i mean that really like kind of lights that fire inside them and shows them and also right i mean i think the biggest lesson you could ever learn in life is something that scares you you go through with it you know, because mm -hmm. I mean, all, almost all the good doors that opened up in my life were from, OK, the, I was really scared. I was nervous. I didn't want to do it. And I went and did it. And afterwards, I was so grateful I did. Mm -hmm. oh, I mean, I can't Taking imagine. Leap. Yeah, I can't imagine the first time stepping into a ring for you. I mean, geez, you must have been. Were you? Uh, I, I think, I mean, I was nervous, but I feel like I was so excited because it's something I, I had talked about doing that since I was a little kid. Mm -hmm. So like for me. I was so excited. Like I used to, I remember like walking around, like when I was like six, like watching rock, my parents let me watch Rocky movies way too early. <laughs> oh yeah. And, uh, you know, I remember like walking around being like, yo, like walking out to the fight. And like, so for, I had visualized it so many times in my head. The, the first time I did, it, I remember like it opened and, uh, like the curtain thing, whatever. And I walked down that stage and there was like a couple thousand people in that. And I was just like, this is freaking crazy. And then it wasn't until I got punched in the face of the first fight. Cause I, I won my first fight, but I took a solid right, right to the jaw. Okay. And I remember thinking like, holy crap, I'm fighting a human being right now. Uh, yeah. Like, what am I doing? Like, we're not sparring. We're not friends. <laughs> yeah. This guy yeah. wants to hurt me. Like, holy cat and that's when it really like set in it wasn't fear at that point it was just like adrenaline like i need to it's you know handle this before this guy this guy makes me look real dumb well man so, that is, yeah, that, it was it's fun that takes a special breed of person to do that so congrats to you no, for becoming a professional fighter no, thanks amazing. man well i mean same thing with i think people don't respect enough like the how hard it is to do like the bodybuilding stuff like people are like oh you stand there and it's not i'm like you try to do that live that lifestyle for eight weeks and see what happens yeah it's freaking miserable <laughs> i know and people just like to write like steroids or whatever yeah. and i mean even if you're doing you're, if you're not in the natural league you're in the untested league those guys work hard i mean you don't do steroids yeah. and eat cheetos no, and yeah. look jacked and <laughs> exactly no you work eight hours a day in the gym and yeah. the steroids just make you that boost yeah. of energy but like you have to work hard those guys eat like eight to twelve times a day mm -hmm. i mean they have to wake up at three in the morning because if you're like 250 pounds of muscle if you don't eat that many times 
you go eight hours sleeping through the night, your body actually loses like five pounds because it's just so much muscle. Your body can't keep up with it. Absolutely. Um, body has no desire to carry around that much. Yeah. It's still in the uh, the caveman days of thinking, <laughs> why do I need this much? The resources yeah, are yeah. scarce. Why are you making me do this? Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. Yeah, it's crazy guys to yeah. pick up weights and carry them around for no reason. <laughs> But yeah, no, it's it's brutal. So what are you doing now? Like now that you're, you're already, how long have you been a PA? Okay, so I went to, started PA school 2008, the actual graduate school, graduated 2010. Okay. Um, so as a PA, I would say to any PA students out there, that is probably the biggest, the scariest leap. Because of course, it's scary when you go from the classroom to your, you know, browns and you know working mm-hmm. in the hospitals as a student but you still got your preceptor with you right so you know it's really still not up to you if you make a mistake yeah it's you, on yeah, yeah that's you know, checking you yeah he's kind of you know I, I don't know what to do here they come help you the scariest leap and i was almost jealous of doctors at that point because i kind of wanted a residency you know i was like wow i just got to go and do my job now <laughs> <laughs> wait <laughs> yeah so that was the biggest thing so I, I i went to school in springfield massachusetts i'm from new york i went to school in springfield in my undergrad and grad there and then i moved to charleston and i wanted a job here but no one would hire me because i didn't have experience so i had to take a job and the because i knew that i was so new and green and you know really just needed help the main thing i looked for with the boss was when we went through interviews was listen i'm brand new i'm out of school i need to know that you're going to be okay with me asking you for help a lot you Mm -hmm. know the first six months i'm probably going to be calling you a couple times a day and so i was couldn't get a job in charleston because everybody wanted experience i found this job in spartanburg regional in spartanburg and it was an inpatient medicine team and it, every day it was a dot one doctor and two or three mid-levels and we'd round on all the patients and the boss was like oh, tom he's like call me as much as you want he was the nicest guy um uh, and i took the job and he was amazing i mean i when i first started i was calling him like six seven times a day because you know it's like the little things that they don't teach you you know like uh, i mean so many things when it's like you know, the Foley's clogged or, you know, um, the patient's not peeing, you know, you got to give them, okay, bladder, scan them. And then if it's over 250, 300 mLs in and out catheter, if you got to do it more than one or two times, call me, we'll stick a Foley in. Like things like that, you know, you don't really get taught in school. So mm-hmm. it was all these little things. And, and I mean, I remember getting out of school and it when like the first time I'm writing an order, I'm like, oh my God, this is like me ordering. <laughs> and I'm like, cha- I'm like starting somebody or just increasing their like metorbal all dose. And I'm like, their heart's going to stop. I know it. <laughs> I know I'm, for sure. Yeah. I'm thinking they're going to go from like a heart rate of 80 to like 10 because I increased the dose. Um, so it, it was, it was daunting. It was scary. Um, but you just got to trust that you learned, you know, what you need to know and, Really, once you graduate, it's all about just applying what you know, right? Mm-hmm. And, and then learning all those little things that you didn't know. And that's why it's so important to, one, pick a job with a boss who is very cool and laid back and won't mind you calling them or asking them a million questions. Because uh, trust me, within six months, you may be calling them once a day. And then within the first year, you're pretty much not calling them anymore. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you're just your ability to practice just skyrockets over that first year. Um, and then second, be nice to the nurses. You know, Man. They are, if if they like you, they will help you. You know, at first I'm like, so what, what is normally ordered? You know, like, mm-hmm. you know, just kind of feeling them out. What would you do here? I don't know what happens here. And if you're nice to them, because first of all, nurses are the backbone of the hospital industry. Heck yeah. They do all the hard work. I mean, with uh, they do it all. They really do. I, I am very aware how lucky I am with my job. That when somebody's extremely constipated, I get to type in an order for an enema, as you know, milk and molasses enema, <laughs> and then this poor nurse has got to go in there and do it. You right. Know? So I'm well aware of how hard they work and um, how lucky I am to do what I do with my job. Um, so being on the nurse's good side is a huge bonus because they will help you. They'll show you where everything is if they like you. So, man, I, I like that you said that because I, especially like on Instagram, there's a lot of nurse followers, and I, I think that that. You know, people don't realize, you know, there's a lot, especially the, there's so much ego in medicine, right? And you got, you know, people coming out of med school that are very well educated in, you know, as far as 
book smarts. However, there's a whole world of stuff that you, you you've not experienced, or like little caveats to the algorithm that you thought you memorized. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you have nurses. Some of them are on these floors. They've been working there for years and years. They've seen it all. And it's like I, I know firsthand just because you know my sister-in-law is a nurse and transplant. And yeah, yeah. A lot of my friends are nurses, and you know I'll hear the stories they tell about the, like MD residents or farm residents or you know whoever talking to them like. Uh, you know, you, you don't know, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah. I'm the doctor. You need to, it's like, man, that's just the wrong, especially, I mean, it's never the good way to be ever period. But like when you're new, like you gotta be crazy to come out with that attitude. Right. I have never once raised my voice. Cause first of all, do you think the nurse wants to be calling you at three in the morning? Mm-hmm. No. I mean, they, they, they know they're bothering you, you right. know? And, to, and then most of the time it's because they have to. And so what if they're new, maybe they're asking something that could have waited till six in the morning. But who, like, are they your child? Are you, like, mm-hmm. who are you to reprimand them like that, mm-hmm. right? I mean, they're working very hard to try to do their job. They'll learn, so. I think that's important, too. Even for, like, the pharmacist listening to, like, when you finish school, let's say you're going to go straight into retail. Yeah. You're not going to do a residency. You know, there's so many people that I've seen come out of school and I experienced, cause I was a technician when I was 18 years old. Like I, I saw this, like I see a guy come out of these 26, 27, he's a new farm day. Like they talk down to you because you're just a tech and they're, you know, whatever. But I, I literally, because I saw it firsthand when I finished school, I, I uh, was working and like doing the retail thing at first. Did you, um, you didn't do a residency? So I didn't. Uh, okay. um, actually, I did. a. Um, we've talked about this before on the podcast, but I, I joke and call it a, a self-taught residency. <laughs> okay. Didn't, That's didn't, what I did. I didn't yeah. take my uh, my first vacation day and like actually go on a true vacation for the first three years of my career. Like I spent every day that I had PTO yeah. and spend it down at MUSC, like volunteering, listening to patient cases and like trying to learn and spend wow. time with mentors. I had a lot of good people that like let me keep right. coming back in the hospital. That's impressive. <laughs> and so uh, I learned significantly more um, after school than I did, you know, even during school, I feel like. So I'm, mm. um, I, I joke and say it's a self taught residency, yeah. but I've had to do my, uh, um, certain like sort of certified diabetes educator and certain credentialing and stuff like after the fact because I didn't do a re- residency probably would have been a lot easier actually to just do it, <laughs> yeah, right? it a year or two and go but um, you know whatever I'm definitely not regretting the way things no. have happened yeah but um anyways I say all that to, to I started you know my first week out I had a farm D and I'm naturally a very confident person like I'm wasn't even really all that scared I guess to be on my first shift I was joking around like we got this like because they were like oh geez this guy's gonna <laughs> <laughs> for a week and so i was joking around with something but i asked every single because i was floating around in different sites back then okay and uh, i asked every single technician like hey what can i next time i'm here like what can i do to be like a better pharmacist didn't help you out more like what can i do what did i what did i screw up on what is your normal pharmacy manager like how they run thing and like they always got like this weird look like is he like just a trick or and and i definitely don't say that to be like oh look at me no yeah but I just, I saw how arrogant it comes off when you think you're, you got, you know, your crap don't stink and you're the man yeah. because of some initials after your name and 100%. you don't, you don't respect the people who do it in and out day in, day out. Like, um, it's just a different mind. And you really like the respect I both truly believe is like earned. It's not, you know, uh, just something that is, is uh, acquired because of some initials after your name. I mean, bedside manner is I think the one thing you can't teach, right? Mm-hmm. 100%. I mean, I had kids drop out of my IPA class because when we first finally started going out to the hospitals, they were getting complaints from patients or the preceptors could not stand them because every time they tried to teach them something, it was like, I know, I know, I know that, you know, and who mm-hmm. wants to teach somebody who's like, if you know it, let your preceptor tell you and teach you and say, oh, okay, great. You know, I mean then they feel like they're teaching you maybe they'll learn something new along the way but do not be the i know person because that'll uh yeah i mean the, it'll quickly become bad well you're gonna find the preceptor who is very up on his his game and or her game and uh you know because like for me with and I'm, i don't put myself in that group but one of the things that i do with students when i'm precepting is i just say okay why yeah, great. You know that uh, my gold dose in heart, you know, heart failure is uh, is metoprolol sucks and is two hundred milligrams. Why? Where's that data come from? What patients were included in the that landmark trial? Why? What if I want to switch into carvedilol? Why would I switch into carvedilol? Like, yeah. What, and I'll just keep asking questions until I'm like, oh, not so. Uh, yeah. Not so sure yourself. And in 
because I don't want, I want it to be. And you know, and there's definitely time there's students that'll ask me questions and I don't know. And I'm like, shoot, man, that's awesome. Yeah. Good. Now I'm, I'm mad at myself. I don't get to go to bed the next. I have to read. That's my, <laughs> um, that's my self-inflicted punishment for not knowing the answers to stuff. But I think, um, you know, asking why, for those of you a precept, um, I, that's been super successful for me personally too. Because then I'll ask why. I'm like, shoot, I don't know why. Yeah. And then you find holes in your game too. One hundred percent. That yeah. So ask why. Don't say I know. And when they ask who wants to do something, raise your hand. Volunteer. Yes. They are. If you're in volunteering for everything, first of all, you learn. A hundred percent. I mean, you get to learn. You get to do these procedures. Otherwise, the first time you do it, you're looking. You're taking a bathroom bake, watching the YouTube video. <laughs> I had to do this procedure before you walk in there, that's, which that's we've awesome. all been there, but um, uh, it's uh, it's much better to do it when there's a preceptor over you, for sure. You know, And you never know when like that preceptor is going to be impressed. And that they just happen to be the chair of a certain department you want to work at at a certain... Like, you just never know. Yes, yes. Like, yeah. I know, I remember very vividly, like, um, one of the, the only example that I always tell when I'm talking about this type of subject with students is I'm like, I remember um, one of my um, I was in the stickyu and one of my uh, my uh, preceptor um, was a, uh, was a uh, critical care pharmacist and then I was with the PGY two resident who was super smart. Okay. Um, I've still kind of kept in touch with her here and there and super super smart. I've never felt dumber in my entire life being on that rotation. I was like, wow, I don't know anything. Especially critical care is a whole different humbling, just humbling world. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I remember like i was like i just felt so dumb and then they said who wants to do um a presentation on traumatic brain injury um for all the the critical care and like um thoracic uh you know team and all that stuff for the critical care units um on uh, the floor for the farm d's and all that and the students and residents and i was like i'll do it because my first thought was um like i'm not freaking talking in front of all of them there's no way yes yeah. So like I just forced myself like I'll do raise my hand like what am I doing yeah, I don't know yeah. anything about traumatic brain injury <laughs> no injured. don't pick me <laughs> yeah it's like I remember I stayed up for like three days and like it helped because it one it showed me that if I put in that work like I just didn't sleep for like almost seventy two hours is ridiculous trying to prep for that stinking thing because I, I still had to go to rotation I would have been oh right yeah you had to do your rotation and then oh man <laughs> and go home and do it um, but it also like it you know developed relationships and, and it got, I got an ended up getting an A on a rotation that most people wouldn't get an A. He told me straight up, like people have worked there behind off and gotten a B so just to let you know, like that was my first day and he wasn't joking. This wasn't like a, let's just psych you out. No, this, yeah. this guy was not playing around. Yeah. And, um, you know, I just, it, it allowed me to one, get that confidence. And then two, like I met relationships with all those people and, um, you know, you utilize some of the faculty to do the presentation to begin with and like bounce some ideas off. So he came closer with them. And, uh, you know, just, you just never know what doors are going to be open and like who you're going to meet, who you're going to be impressed by you trying something. So I mean, I totally, I love that you said that because that's so freaking important. And then not just students don't get that. They're tired. Yeah. They want to go home. Xbox is not going anywhere. Netflix isn't going anywhere. It's still right? going to be there. I know. You're just, racing home to what? Sit on your couch? Right. And I mean, how much did you learn that rotation, right? A ton. Yeah. A ton. You, right? So the worst, hardest, scariest rotation, you come out of it such a better provider. You're that much stronger. So that's why I really think, you know, doing what scares you, you know, raising your hand and be like, this sucks. I don't want to do it, but I'm going to. And then you come out of it. And they're impressed because you actually stood up there. And they know. They understand. Mm -hmm. right? They're like, here's a student trying to present to <laughs> us who know much more than him. This is adorable. Yeah, yeah. But they're, they're like, you know what? He tried. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So really, I mean, that is the thing. Like, you can be much, you know, not do as well book smart wise. But if you have that attitude, a preceptor will always pass you as long as you're trying and showing that you're improving, right? Mm -hmm. Versus the person who knows everything but... Every patient complains, mm -hmm. you know, they, they don't want to be around you. Um, so yeah, that's a huge takeaway. What do you think about, cause one of the things I always try to encourage students who maybe, you know, are middle of the pack as far as performance in class, like the actual didactic portion. One of the things I always encourage them, one, I'm like, I was not good at school and the didactic portion cause I have such a hard time 
sitting still and mm-hmm. being told exactly what I have to memorize and answering a multiple choice question on something that doesn't, you know, some random patient that doesn't yeah. exist and, and having to just get rid of my mind would start to wander. And it was just brutal. Like, yeah. <laughs> terrible. Like did whole horrible, the whole didactic portion of pharmacy school. I got on rotation and I was like, I loved every second. Like that was my zone. Yeah. And so I always encourage students who, you know, I see like in them, you know, they're, they feel like I'm not as smart as so-and-so, but I can just tell like they care about patients. They just, they get, the bedside manager, like you were saying, I'm like just wait, just be patient. If your day's coming, you're gonna be a rock star. Right. You just gotta be patient. Yeah. I um, mean, do you do you do you kind of agree with that? I mean, I really think it really doesn't matter if you're middle of the pack till front of the class because it's totally different seeing patients, right? Mm-hmm. And um, you will learn, and once you're out there seeing patients, that's where I mean, that's why you're doing your job, right? And I mean, there there really is that feeling when you get that patient who's like really wants help. They're really sweet. They're trying and you get to help them. That is the best feeling. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, it's just you walk away. like This is why I do my job. Heck OK. Yeah. 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 So you'll get your bad ones, but um, it's it's worth it. And nobody knows where you were in your class. Exactly. The second you start your job, I mean, nobody has ever asked me in an interview or anything. I'm super glad they haven't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> me me. They've never asked me that either, and it's been v- I've been very fortunate not to be asked. Yeah. But, uh. <laughs> I mean, all they really want to know is how do you do work well with others and the patients, mm-hmm. and you know, you just got to get out there. And my first job, like I said, I I took it, and the thing my boss said was, "Yep, Tom, I'm fine with you calling me." as much as you need me for help and second uh my inpatient medicine service is very busy he's like we only use one physician and then the rest mid-level so you'll be seeing 20 to 30 patients a day um he's like but once he's like you know at the hospital they had five icus we had to cover you know the kidney floor ortho floor neuro floor urology floor so we He's like, when you're done, he's like, give me two or three years and uh, you'll be able to take care of somebody from head to toe. And I stuck it out and it was hard because, I mean, he was always short staffed because nobody wanted to work that much. So I was constantly picking up overtime and, you know, instead of working seven on seven off, I was probably working 10, 11 or, you know, three or four off. Mm. Um, and he wasn't paying me much because I was brand new. I didn't know what I was worth, but I stuck it out for three years and when I left there and took a new job, it was like the easiest thing in the world. So definitely go from hard when you first graduate to easy, I would mm-hmm. say, because you want it to be hard where you learn. Yes, it sucks. You're scared. You're nervous. You don't know what you're doing. You give that a year or two, any job you take after that is like a piece of cake. Mm-hmm. And that I mean, because it, it's it would suck if you take the easiest job where you don't really learn much. You do it for two, three, four years, and then you leave and you go take a new job and you look like a newbie. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh my God, there's so much I don't know. <laughs> and then, you know, you, but you're like, but I've been practicing forever. And you kind of feel like, you know, wow, I, I have to step my game up. So that's what I would recommend doing that. Heck yeah. Um, what, so what, what's the practice setting you're at now? Uh, so I work at a hospital, uh, inpatient medicine. So I've done inpatient medicine mostly, and then I did ER medicine for two, uh, one to two years. Um, ER, you know, so every time I take a job, I don't like, I will never not work le- uh, less than a year because it looks bad on your resume. Mm-hmm. You know, they, nobody wants to see somebody kind of jumping in and out of jobs, you know, every few right. months, six months. Um, so I stuck it out for about 18 months, but man, the emergency room was not for me. It really? was just, yeah, you know, it was just stitching's fun, uh, <laughs> INDing, abscesses is fun, but most of the time it's crummy stuff that should be at a general practitioner office. Mm-hmm. And that's like 90% of your job. Whereas in patient medicine, you're pretty much the ER is like your shield, mm-hmm. right? They're like your filter and only the sick, most of the time, the sick patients get through and those are the ones you take care of. So um, I've done inpatient medicine, emergency medicine. I love inpatient medicine because you show up in the morning, you get your list of patients, and that's who you're going to see. And then who's ever working with you that day, you guys just split up the um, emergency room admissions. So it's like, I'll do one, the doctor will do one, I'll do one, the doctor will do one. And after that first day, you get to know your patients and you keep following them. And so after that first day, you know them very well, you're ordering everything, you're kind of watching them. And then when they're ready, you send them home. And uh, 
I love inpatient medicine for that reason. Um, you know, and then there's not that never ending line of people walking in that door, like the emergency room, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a great job. Um, and so I work in a rural County and I do that, um, especially to all you students out there, because if the County, I believe has a population of less than 50,000, you get help from the federal government. Um, so you get like a certain amount of money every year to help for your federal loans. Mm -hmm. and that is the biggest reason I work there because it's over an hour drive, but I throw on my audio book and I drive out there, there go, and um, my head's clear and I'm ready to work. And then on the way home, I get to listen to my book again. And <laughs> by the time I get home, I'm relaxed, you know, decompressed kind of thing. So what kind of patients are you seeing primarily? Um, so we have, so the place I work now because it's a rural place. Um, so I went from that huge hospital with a million patients a day to, <laughs> There's um, a lot of patients. Yeah, yeah. Um, to a rural hospital with one ICU. It's got six beds, um, and it's much smaller, which is so nice because I actually get to sit down in the room with the patient and actually talk to them. You know, instead of like, you know, you know, when you're so busy that they go off topic a little bit, and you're like, I, I don't want to know that. I just I need mm -hmm. to know if you're having the pain. Is it seven out of ten? That kind of thing. Uh, like, well, my grandkid had the pain once, and you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so now I actually get to sit there and listen to their stories, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but so we get, I would say the majority is like COPD exacerbations, chest pains, stroke, TIA, CVA, where it's not an acute stroke because if they need TPA, we got to send them to MUSC or uh, McLeod Regional in Florence for TPA to see a neurologist, um, DKA, uh, you know, renal failure, dehydration, confusion, alcohol withdrawal, all that stuff. And that's why I love inpatient medicine, because when I was in school, I thought I wanted to do surgery. And then during my surgery rotations, I realized it's pretty much the same couple surgeries over and over and over again. And maybe you get, depending on what surgery, I was thinking ortho or something. But most of the time, each surgical group, whether no matter what you're doing, they have their set few surgeries. That's like 90% of their surgeries. And then the rest are maybe something cool now and then. But I just could not imagine seeing the same exact thing over and over again, standing there in the OR trying to do it over and over again. Um, so inpatient medicine, you get to see pretty much everything. Um, and the one reason I like my place too is one thing that's lacking is we have zero specialists, but also that means I'm dealing with them a lot. So I'm constantly calling MUSC or McLeod Regional in Florence, talking to cardiologists, oncologists, neurologists, running a case by them, being like, I think they need to be sent to you. What do you think? And, you know, if they say yes, I'll transfer them on over to them. So it's cool. I get to deal with a lot, pretty much everything, um, you know, but mostly it's the older population with dementia, confusion, dehydration, COPD, the smokers, forever, things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. Well, um, one of the things that I know for me that kind of I liked – when I was first trying to decide, because originally I wanted to do medical school, and then when I was kind of doing more research, the reason I personally landed on pharmacy school was I yeah. like the ability to kind of be able to jump around to different practice settings. If as long as I did the right things on mine, now if I you know went into retail pharmacy and never opened a book from there on out, yeah, um, I was going to be stuck. But I, that's not the route that I did, and so I was able to kind of jump into like where I'm at now, more like a uh, ambulatory care type setting where I'm seeing diabetes patients and whatnot. Um, you know, I like that. I like the fact that like. I wouldn't have to do too much training to jump into something very different and see all kinds of different patient populations because I get tend to get a little bored easily. And like, so I like to have new challenges, new training opportunities, new whatever. So I like that. Does that, I feel like that's a very common thing with PAs is you guys can do so many different fields. It's kind of crazy. Like you could be in GI for a couple of years and switch to neuro yep. if you find the right people that are going to willing to train you and stuff and do it fairly easily. I feel like, is that oh, accurate? 100%. And first I didn't realize, you know, when I think of pharmacy, I always just always think of like either the the one that works with us at the hospital who kind of goes over all our antibiotics. Mm -hmm. um, so if you work at a bigger hospital, um, you will get a, a pharmacist who kind of rounds on everybody who's on antibiotics, goes over the cultures, the kidney function, things like that, and make sure they're on the right antibiotics. And that's amazing because you learn so much from them. And then the other one, obviously, is retail. Um, but I didn't realize that, that there's so many options for a pharmacist. That's very cool because that's pretty much one of the... I mean, a couple of reasons, you know, med school is insanely hard. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, PA school, that was the thing. Cause I, at that point in my life, I had never stepped foot in a hospital. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. I had never worked, never, 
you know, so I wasn't really sure what I would like about it. And being a PA, um, I spoke uh, with a PA and a couple doctors when I had to do my volunteer shadowing hours. And they were saying, you know, that's the best part about it. You can do GI, you can do, no, you could do anything, work for a urologist, neurosurgeons. And when you work for these people, they train you. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you're pretty much their first assist. You're helping them through their surgeries. You're closing up the patients. You're, you know, rounding on the patients. Um, so you get to see everything. Um, so that's one why I like inpatient medicine, because I get to see everybody from every walk of life and every type of diagnosis. And then two, you know, if I ever get tired of this, I could go to an office in a few mm -hmm. years, work for a surgeon, you know, just work for some kind of dermatologist, you know, do something easy where it's, although I don't know if I would ever do that, but um, yeah, I think that might be a little too boring for me, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think, you know, never say never, you never know what the yeah. future brings, but yeah, I didn't realize that. So pharmacists really get to work almost anywhere. I mean, I mean, it depends. You know, there's different specialty like you know, settings you can go into. Like there's critical care, there's transplant. Um, like my uh, my sister in law works very closely with the transplant pharmacist at MUSC. Um, you know, she's uh, we're hoping to have her on the podcast. Actually, she's super super smart. Yeah, that's but, um, transplant. I mean, that's she's she's a killer. You know, with the transplant meds I and bet. every interaction you can. You know, she's rounds on all the patients. Her and the attendings have great. Uh, um, you, you know, they work great together. It's, so it's definitely a good relationship. She's super smart. Um, you know, there's oncology pharmacists. There's uh, pharmacists that work in cardiovascular areas. I mean, there's just, there's so much. You know, for me personally, I'm doing more of the diabetes education. Yeah. Um, and so I'll actually see patients um, we have collaborative practice so i can um, when i'm at you know my clinic and that's do, doing that role um, i can s start and stop prescriptions or change them and then the physician assistant or whoever will come behind me and sign off on it yeah and uh, um, so I can electronically prescribe to, you know, to get them started. And I've kind of gotten permission from them to do that. Um, and, you know, basically just seeing patients. I'm not actually counting pills and putting them in a bottle, which, it, which it, I hate that because that's what I feel like so many people still think of who haven't like directly worked with pharmacists still kind of consider like, Oh, you just kind of like count the pills, right? Like, why are you relevant? <laughs> and, uh, it's especially for somebody with a good bedside manner, like yourself, you know, very sociable. You don't want to be stuck. Stop it. Right. And then that, <laughs> go on. Go on. <laughs> what else do you think? <laughs> but I mean, right. You don't want to be stuck in nah. a behind a counter and pretty much selling, you know, and I mean, you don't even really ring people up, right? I so, so at this new clinic, we do have a, an outpatient pharmacy. And so the last couple of weeks I have been staffing, um, quite a bit to help them out, but we're slowly transitioning to me spending more and more time in the clinical role and less time dispensing. And, um, but I'll still do that. I mean, I, I actually kind of weirdly like that part of it because okay. you see patients coming through like every couple minutes yeah. and you get, you know, I still get the interaction. I still get the questions. Okay. Um, this setting is so much better than retail because I have time to actually talk to patients and they still see you as a healthcare professional. Whereas in retail, there's the, you're kind of just the guy who rings up the toothpaste. They don't, yeah. I remember one time somebody asked me like, if I went to Trident Tech to become a pharmacist, nothing is Trident Tech, but I'm like, yo, I was in school for not a total of nine years. Like I am a like, doctor. I have, <laughs> yeah. I have a doctor of pharmacy and I, and I would always get the, I know you're not like a real doctor. Oh my goodness. But, which I never like, I could care less if I go and buy the title of that, you know, I don't like I'd say that for the physicians. Yeah. Cool. Whatever. But it was just like, like, why would you start the conversation like that? Like, yeah. yeah. Like, like, why would you ask my opinion on something <laughs> I know. If, if you don't trust me? It was I know you don't know what you're talking yeah, about. Listen, but, I know uh, you're not like an educated person, but yeah. what, what should I give my infant for uh, <laughs> the fever? I'm like, why would you trust me? I got my, uh, my lab coat at Halloween express, but, um, no, I just, this clinic, like this setting, even when I'm dispensing, I still have so much more time to speak with patients. I can answer questions and they still kind of see you in that role. And so it, it makes it so much more, um, just, just so much more, I guess, uh, um, rewarding is the word yeah. looking for. Like, because it, you just get to develop more of a relationship with patients. So first of all, I would love a pharmacist coming behind me. Like, you know, when I'm discharging somebody who came in with the sugar of 700 and they're a new diabetic, if I'm sending them home and discharging their meds, I would love if a pharmacist, whether they're at Walmart and they call me or they're in the hospital, I'm like, hey, Tom, you know, I saw you're sending them home on like metformin and sliding scale or something. You know, you know, best thing to do is this and this. And I would be like, please tell me, you know, I mean, that would be amazing. Um, and second of all, what do you think? Um, I mean, that's going to become such a huge role, pharmacists doing a clinical setting, because the amount of 
I mean, what, we're going to have like 90,000, we'll be 90,000 doctors short, mm -hmm. something like that in 10 years because of the baby boomers and yeah. retiring. So, I mean, besides mid-levels is one answer to that. It's going to be have to be pharmacists having, um, you know, like almost like offices. and. So there, the they consults. are, there's a huge push right now, um, you know, amongst the pharmacists and the political, you know, arena okay, that are yeah. pushing for provider status. Yeah. Um, it's because we have so many different um, like careers, paths for pharmacists, the retail pharmacists may not care what the hospital pharmacists are doing. There's a lot of disconnect. So like, whereas like nurses, they, they like come together like yeah. in brute force and get something pushed through politically in five seconds. It's yeah. ridiculous. They're a lobbying group. Is uh, oh yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. second to none. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So like we are still in that weird position where, you know, 50 years ago, the pharmacist was like the guy who literally had an, like a bachelor's degree, put some potions together and like just did what your doctor told him to do. You know, like yeah. it was, there was no clinical pharmacist. I really. didn't realize that. And so it's a, we're still a really short lived kind of profession. We're still, we, we've established some of the bigger hospitals like MUSC, they have a hospital, they have a pharmacist that rounds on every floor, like yeah. multiple, floor, you know, they have PharmD clinics, they have other things set up already because there's such a huge, you know, medical teaching university. Other hospitals, they were like, well, what, why would we have a pharmacist here? Like, it, you know, it was weird. Like, even with this new clinical setting that I'm in, um, we didn't have too many. They had one pharmacist that had kind of laid the foundation. And a lot of people didn't even realize he was a pharmacist. They just called him doctor. Really? And they, they didn't realize he was a I was like, yeah, you know, he's a, like, he's a pharmacist. And they're like, wow, really? Why isn't he counting the pills? Now? <laughs> and, it, you know, and he did such a good job. They're like, oh, okay. And that's yeah. why they ended up... Um, you know, end up okaying the, the position for me to come in um, because they had uh, realized that, oh, it is beneficial. Like, he's not here to, like, tell us what we're doing wrong. Yeah. He's here to just provide support and help. And if I can sit and talk to a patient for 30 minutes and that frees you up to go do right? something else, because I don't have the diagnostic portion of it. That's where I'm, you know, would be very, very weak in. And so if, if I can free up you to go see another patient and start that process and I can sit down and go over their insulin injections, talk about their sliding scale, talk about the nutrition portion even. Yeah. Um, oh. That takes all that off of you. Oh my God. Yeah. And that's where the, the thought, it's supposed to be a collaboration, not a, a PharmD coming in there because they think they know. You yeah. Know, the, so. I, I yeah. could see the older generation's because they, that's what they probably dealt with. Right? 100%. Pharmacists who are bachelor degrees. Mm -hmm. And now, I mean, you know, you're a doctor. Mm -hmm. You have your doctorate and you're out there seeing patients doing, you know, clinics. And I, I think as the generations change, it's going to be much more accepted. Yeah. Right? I mean, because I would take all the help I could get. Right. I mean, I think we're like our generation's brought up to understand collaborative practice yeah. like interprofessionalism is like harped on so much at musc at least is it uh, yeah oh my gosh we had to do projects with the nursing students with the, the md students with the pas like because they want us to be like you guys are like well, there's no there shouldn't be well we're team pharmacy we're team you know whatever and this like weird like disconnect and so they they've done the musc's done a really good job about really pushing interprofessionalism it's been pretty cool to see that's great i saw they're doing the new campus with the citadel mall is do you know what that's gonna be mm -hmm. yeah they got this huge sign now outside the citadel mall in west ashley they have the building that's you know those like weird looking buildings that are like across the way there mm -hmm. the, there's like a secret like musc offices all through there but they have um, actually farm D's and nurses who also have it backgrounds okay doing like all kinds of different uh stuff with tech up in that weird it's like i, I got a tour from uh dr beju shah for those of you who heard it, we had him on the podcast um it's fascinating up there it's, it's really literally, yeah i didn't even know that building exists and yeah he like, he like let me in he was like show me around and it's just a bunch of uh people who like don't actually see patients they're all on the tech side um it side but they're all licensed either nurses or pharmacists or whatever it's pretty cool yeah yeah and, and musc is doing some good stuff man they are amazing. i don't just say that because uh, i went there like i'm a little bit biased obviously but um i really like how innovative they've they've been that's great that's good to know because i mean you know when choosing to send a patient somewhere i always recommend a musc but i mean i think everybody knows they're the number one hospital in the state but i didn't know all this about them that's very yeah. impressive i mean just like anything else you know, it's a teaching hospital there's mistakes there's things that go wrong yeah. but i think all in all they're they're trying to be innovative they're trying to look for the next um big thing so it's it's cool to kind of see someone that's willing to look to the future not just like well i've always done it this way why would i 
Yeah. Why would I change it in 2018? Yeah. With yeah. all this new technology. Just because evidence says so. Yeah. yeah because you it. should. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because we're going to have drones delivering medicine soon. That's <laughs> yeah. why you should change it. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. I say, and, you know, I would say the going back to the student thing, um, or as a practitioner, please do not be afraid to say, I don't know. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's nothing worse than trying to bullcrap your way out of a situation. 100%. Like you didn't read the study or you just don't know what to do with this. You know, you try to come up with something and then, and so, you know, you get a specialist involved and you look like an idiot. Mm-hmm. And then you give this bad reputation to whatever you're representing, whether it's PAs, MPs, farms, doctors. So... And nobody minds. It's no, you know, nobody's, right. you know, because you're not supposed to know everything. Right. It's impossible. Yeah. And, you know, trust me, it looks much better to say, I don't know. Let me go look that up. Mm-hmm. I'll be right back. And it's, uh, and you learn a lot. Heck yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I know one thing, and, and I want you to kind of address this too for the students. Um, when, when I was going through my fourth year, kind of like kind of mentally prepping for being on my, you know, a licensed pharmacist, I started looking at like something on rotation that had nothing to do with the rotation. Like, let's say, um, just something random, like uh, I'd see lisinopril on a patient's chart, be like, you know, I don't know the kinetics behind lisinopril. Like, what's the half life? What's like the you know um, mechanism of action? Like, t- you know, inside and out. You know, it's different things about the drug that maybe has like you know some of the the more gr- nitty gritty like pharmacology type stuff. So I would go home that night and I would, I started doing like fifteen minutes a night where I would spend that time kind of reviewing. Um, something about that drug that had nothing to do with rotation. It wasn't for my preceptor. It was just yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, to get myself in that habit, I started doing it at nighttime before I went to bed. That was my time okay. to do it. Um, and now I've, I've done it for so long now that now I have all these uh, different um, like emails and stuff that come to me with different trials. And it's obviously gotten a lot more elaborate than looking at like less Yeah. But yeah. Um, you know now it's I'll get like a, the Journal Watch from New England Journal of Medicine for rheumatology and this is new studies coming out. And I don't necessarily deal with rheumatology all that much. However, I don't know what's coming a year from now. Yeah, Maybe yeah. we'll start a biggest you know at my clinic they bring in a uh, yeah, yeah. rheumatologist and. Yeah. I need to get that being sharp. And so I'll read through that before I go to sleep. And this has been kind of my, um, some people in the morning, you know, some, you know, whatever you works for you, but I always encourage students to like start now because like, if you can get in the habit of doing it and just kind of continue that habit, um, because so many people are like, Oh, well I'm doing so much now. I already have so much work. Like I'll start, like you always have 10 more minutes. Yes. You can find 10 stinking minutes somewhere. And if you can get in that habit, like that'll, carry you so far if you can just stay in habit, you'll learn so much over the next couple of years after actually being a practitioner do you i mean kind of agree with that mindset i uh totally agree um you know i would say especially starting like you said um you know when you're in doing your didactic year you're studying so much mm-hmm. but once you're once you start rounding in the hospitals and doing your clinicals um those that's the time to really start going home and following up on what you didn't know, you know, make a little note for yourself. I mean, nowadays, you know, look, open your iPhone, put it in your notes section, mm-hmm. like, you know, whatever, you know, acute renal failure, or, you know, whatever you need to know, whatever you didn't know, the doctor asked you, um, because that's when you really will have the time because now you're doing your job. But when you go home, you don't have to study, right? Because you don't have this huge test coming up. I mean, you should study. But um, so to do that, it just slowly builds this huge base of knowledge and then when you get out and i use up to date mm-hmm. uh, is that what you guys use um i use up to date i use dynamed i use okay. a lot of medscape okay i signed myself up for like every they're like what specialty are you and i just like clicked all of them <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i'm all these things send me emails <laughs> send me and then everything. i just i just yeah. click through stuff that you know is pertinent to me yeah so and uh, i um you know i uh i would say once a week i try to pick something to go over because you'll be amazed at how, you know, especially so when you start, when you're going through your clinicals, definitely do what Mike said, you know, try to study 10, 15 minutes about something, one of those diagnoses, because it'll slowly drill it in your head. And then when you get out of school, I always try to go over things, especially things you think, you know, Mm -hmm. because I'll go on up to date and, you know, congestive heart failure, you know, and Tresto, things like that. (laughs) Like, you know, I'll see patients using it, but you can't just start it. You know, you have Mm -hmm. to, you know, there's a certain way to go about starting it. And I mean, you learn so much and about things that you think, you know, and, you know, you, you don't want to be that guy that's like using, you know, a trial that's 20 years old. Mm-hmm. So I would say at least going up to date and just run over the things. And they got so many links to the mm-hmm. other diagnoses that you end up going down this, you know, rabbit hole. But And, and ask yourself, like, I, I would always say, like, ask yourself, okay, well, why is that happening? Like, why is Secubitrol, 
in Velsartan more beneficial than an ACE inhibitor by itself. Yeah. You know, okay, like you understand the biochemistry behind that. Okay, well, do I have any evidence for it? And like go through like and, and trust those cases like Paradigm HF. Okay, well, what patients were included in that? Oh, well, patients who had already tolerated an ACE, um, you know, which sort of, uh, you know, outcomes were they looking at? Is this relevant to my patient population? Like going and asking yourself, well, does this make sense? Does that make sense? Do I understand this? If somebody asked me this, okay, it, it increases uh, or decreases mortality. Is that good? Like, is it increase it a lot? Like, do you understand? Like, well, interest though, I'm going to treat like 21 for that primary outcome. Like, that's a that's a pretty awesome, uh, you know, decrease in uh, mortality and hospitalization. It's you, huge, yeah. So, but other drugs like you know, uh, like Prevnar 13 vaccine, okay. you can treat a thousand people to prevent one case of community acquired pneumonia that I can treat with a stinking Z pack. It's like you know, there's, there's so many different variables, and like, do you? truly understand how that's going to impact your patient population and like asking why, 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 and how, and you know, all the things you can kind of get your mind to, you'll go down a rabbit trail. Next thing you know, it'll be like an hour later and you're like, shoot, I'm smarter. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, you literally walk away from using up to date or any of those mm-hmm. websites and you're like, Whoa, I, you know, I mean, just learning when somebody's acidotic metabolic acidosis and why to use d5 fluids instead of regular you mm-hmm. know because the glucose helps uh, you know your body um neutralize i mean it's unbelievable you're like because you're always just it's just little things like that and then you'll get that patient you'll put them on those fluids or you'll see a physician or a mid-level not put them on those fluids and you put them on and they'll ask you why you're like well <laughs> and, mm-hmm. and i mean it's just not only are you doing the right thing for the patient but it really helps you become a stronger provider and Heck yeah. um um also like you were saying when say if you're trying to switch from one drug to the other like you said why Mm -hmm. because so if it's because the drug rep told you (laughs) yeah yeah or the study said that but what is the difference between that drug and this one and if you're going to switch is it really worth it because not only is insurance trust a way more expensive you know now you got to take it twice a day Mm -hmm. say instead of once and is it worth it is the patient paying a lot of money for pretty much no benefit maybe a couple percent that kind of thing yeah um but you know honestly um i love the way you look at that because i'm going to start doing that more you know i I don't i i find i don't ask why enough now i'm going to start doing that more. (laughs) right on yeah i I had this uh this one uh he's he's you know professor also just like a mentor to me his name is uh, dr wayne wirt um down at musc he's been retired for a long time and he still goes there every single day i don't think anybody told him that you don't have to come when he's retired that's great he loves pharmacology he's he's the smartest person i've ever met in my life hands down he's crazy genius crazy (laughs) So, um, I heard, I would it first started kind of like registering with me because the students would be presenting a case to him and, uh, he would say, um, oh, well, why did we had that? And the student had the trial name ready to go, like the landmark trial. Oh, it was, uh, accomplish for, um, you know, whether I should use an ACE inhibitor and a thiazide or a, a ACE inhibitor and a calcium channel blocker. Oh, accomplish trial showed blah, blah, blah. And they had like that memorized and you go, well, was your pa- would your patient be included in the accomplish trial? And just that look of like crap. Yeah. I have no idea. And it was, he was like, well, your patient didn't meet these two criteria. So they would have been included. So can we extrapolate that to that patient? What other evidence do you, and wow. He, he was just like, I mean, that was the first time I realized, like, holy cow, like, there's a whole different, like, depth that you have to understand oh pharmacotherapy and, like, this, the using evidence based medicine. That's where I kind of fell in love with it because I'm like, I get to play this game forever. Right? That like, guy sounds brilliant. Oh, he's awesome. I, you need to meet him. He's, like, the greatest. And he's the nicest, most humble person you will ever meet in your life. Like, he's, he's great. That's awesome. He's been uh, one of the biggest. Um, uh, influences in my career and he's helped me out so many times put me on like his uh, evidence-based medicine um uh, like conference that he hosts let me go like i had like these super like decorated cardiologists endocrinologists up there and then freaking me it was rid- it was like such a joke and yeah. he still put me on he's, he's been awesome that's amazing i owe him quite a bit as far as any kind of success i've had in my career for sure isn't it like just when you come across a, a provider or you know pr- a practitioner who just has these br- minds with just so much experience and so much knowledge i mean it's just you just want to like suck it out. Like, mm-hmm. how do you get, you know what I mean? Like, I can't wait till I'm 10 years down the road and I'm half, half of what you have. Um, go ahead. It, it, well, look, the, since you said that, that kind of dawned on me because like one of the things that always used to frustrate me is when he was one of the ones I would spend a lot of my time with. I would take PTO days when okay. I was first graduate to go spend time with him. Cause I'm yeah. like, he's, you know, people spend all this money with these seminars. I can go for free and sit in this guy's office and yeah. just pick his brain. And he was more than happy to talk, you know, shop with anybody. Yeah. And, uh, 
super easy to talk to, su- love teaching and talking to good. And people were telling me like I was crazy for taking my PTO to go do that. I'm like, really? Like, like this guy is right here in Charleston where I live 10 minutes from my stinking house. And I'm like, you're like oh, you're going to burn yourself out. Like, I don't, that's not a vacation. Like you're supposed to be like relaxing on your PTO. Like, okay, you go do that. I'm going to go do my thing and we'll see how it plays out in five years. Right. And it doesn't take long. Yeah. You literally go a couple hours. Yeah. Just, to, just the still amount of relax. knowledge that still, rubs off on you. Still play Xbox. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> I had um, a mentor. His name is Dr. Joe Breton. He practiced in Connecticut. And, um, so my, that was the one thing that was really lacking. So our pharmacist, our pharmacology teacher, like got diagnosed with cancer when I was in oh, school. Geez. And so they had to stop. So we had to get a new one in and they weren't really well prepared. So it was pretty lacking. And then the guy who took over the job, my mentor, Dr. Joe Breton, um, he, uh, he took over the job teaching pharmacology, but it was, gen- and so I, um, did a rotation with him and then I chose to do my elective rotations with him. He got me into Brazilian jiu-jitsu because he would roll, he would kick my ass. That's awesome. But we would hang out and he was the coolest guy. And he was the first one who taught me like, all right, why are you going to use this? You know, oh, I would do this. Is that what you do? He's like, I don't know. Would I? He's like, tell me what you would do. Why would you do it? And he would, he's the one who would present me with all these trials, heart trial, you know, use Ramipril, Altace, things like that. You know, I mean, it just really revolutionized the way I looked at everything and, I think that is another thing um, that uh, PA students needed a lot of is really to learn to not just look at, you know, when you're going through school, okay, hypertension, what population to use what blood pressure meds in. And that's all you want to know, right? Calcium channel block or, you know, ACE inhibitor or ARB. Don't tell my, don't tell my PA students. <laughs> I had to memorize and trial names and everything. I was like, I, I was like, yeah, I've never, this is my first year teaching, so <laughs> well, this no, is how it's going to be done. <laughs> that, that's what he, I, I, I wish that's the way my class went because you just, all you know is what you need to use, but you don't know why. Mm-hmm. You don't know real. you just kind of know, okay, African-American, calcium channel, you know what I mean? It's just... Once you look at these studies, it really dawns on you why this is why I'm doing it because the uh, you know the medicine you know the evidence shows to use this and it's decreased mortality you know coronary. Uh, I mean, it, it's the way you need to look at things. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really wish I had a teacher like you, man, because well, I was just uh, it, I had to do a lot of learning on my own. I, I'm still very new at it, so <laughs> I don't want definitely don't want to say like I'm anything special. I'm I'm learning as I go, so I feel bad for my students. Uh, you like kind it? of been my game, dude. Love it. Yeah, you like teaching. Love it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's been definitely the most challenging thing that I've done, but like I, I love it, man. It's just like yeah, the, the amount of hours and stuff that I've put into it, like don't justify it all like the pay or anything like that so it's completely me doing it's like, like a I, dollar I, an hour <laughs> yeah you, I mean, in, in, not even that i mean the school takes you know good care of me but mm-hmm. i just it has nothing to do with the money it has nothing to do with anything i could ever like it's just i love doing it because like you get to see one of the like happiest times it's just come shout out to uh, courtney in my class she uh she came back from break she had, had like a week they had like a week off and she went and volunteered at this um I think it was a long-term care facility. And she was like, yeah, I was with, uh, I think she was with a clinical pharmacist actually. Okay. And she said, asked about switching hydrochlorothiazide um, to endapamide. So there's like one thiazide direct to the other. And they were like, well, why? I hope I'm telling the story right, Courtney. But um, she, Courtney. she said, uh, she's like, well, why, why do you want it? She's like, well, there's no evidence for like outcome data with hydrochlorothiazide. But endapamide, you know, we saw it in the high vet trial. We had, we had decreased mortality in patients that were 80 to 100 years old. We saw it post-stroke in the progress trial when you use it with an ACE inhibitor and then uh you know plus it has calcium channel blocking properties so you get a little bit better blood pressure lowering effect and like she said the pharmacist was like what the heck and i was so i was wow. like wow yo i'm so freaking proud right now you have no idea yeah i just learned something that's awesome man and, and it was just like that's that's what i love i love like because i had so many people do that for me it was like give me those aha moments yeah. of like you know we just do a straight nerd out yeah and, yeah and i to see that now like in students who are not much younger than i am and like kind of see them like oh Oh shoot, that's why I'm doing this. Like I, now, I, you know, I can yeah. I can tell you why I'm doing. It. It's so cool, man. I love it. It must keep you on your game too. It does because I feel so stupid when I can't answer a question for them. Right, I, and I still tell them I don't know, but I'm like. I go home and I'm just like, idiot, idiot, you don't deserve a farm day. What is wrong with you? You need to be fired immediately. I, I feel like it, even if like I was writing up my slides and I did know, I would double check everything because I'd be so afraid of giving them the wrong info. Oh, and man. then they go try to put it out there in the world and they get like, you know, embarrassed and they come back to you. You're like, it's your oh, fault. sorry. Man, I had every one of my slides like kind of 
already done before okay. like these like farm one, two, and three started. Yeah. I have redone every single solitary slide <laughs> set. Literally some of them from scratch because I was like, I hate this. I can't teach them that. This is not going to be clear. Cause, and, you know, and I've learned stuff as I've gone and like starting implementing like case studies while I'm actually teaching the, the stuff to help them like kind of see how it would play out in real. And like I've tried all kinds of different things. That's what I say. Like I'm so uh, thankful that my, you know, this first group was not like super hard on me because yeah. I, I just, they were my guinea pigs essentially. So this is your first year? Yeah. Really? They did sign me on for a second year. So they must, the school must have not been like too. So you just started September? No, I saw, I just started and uh, they started, I started teaching them because they started like the gross anatomy and stuff in 2017. I started, okay. I think the uh, end of January this year. Okay. 2018. Okay, and so the so beginning of 18, basically. Tomorrow, like Thursday's their final exam for Farm 3, and then they'll start their last little bit before they start clinical. Oh, man. So, so I've so seen them go from, like, literally not knowing a single thing, and me saying, like, Cytochrome P450, and then, like, their minds exploding to, like, <laughs> them just like, yeah, 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 what's next? Like, what's yeah. the next K? Like, it's been really cool. That is awesome. That yeah, is, that's it's amazing. Good, man. I always wanted to teach, I think. I think that would be fun. Dude, pick a subject you want to teach and come teach one of my lectures for me. Yeah. Try it out. All right, I'll come help you one yeah, day. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Yeah. I mean, yeah, anything you want to do. Yeah. Have my students help me out that think that they want to end up teaching. And yeah, that'd be great, man. Yeah, that seems like such a rewarding thing. It's fun. Yeah. It's, I, I, like, it's it's weird because like I, I watch their test scores come in in real time with like the software that we use. Yeah. And uh, I literally sit there like more nervous than any like test I ever took in my life. I just sit there like watching the screen, like refresh, refresh. And like, it's really, I'm like, what the heck do I like? But yeah. I feel like I'm like on their team. I'm like that weird, like That's awesome. dude still hanging out with them. They're like, why is the old guy here? Like, but I, I just, uh, I don't know, man. I just can't, uh, I feel like I'm like so invested in, in them young. that, yeah, dude, it really does. And yeah. it's cool. I think, uh, I want them to come, you know, become fantastic practitioners so I can call on them and ask them questions. Soon. Yeah. Yeah. See them out there like prescribing drugs and you're like, oh, still know what they're doing. Mm, yeah. Still know it. <laughs> yeah. Still got it. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That is great. So your um, diabetes clinic, what do you get? Like a physician will send them to you? Yeah, they re refer to diabetes education. Okay. And so they schedule appointments and then the patients come in for an appointment just like they would to see their uh, you know primary care doc. Okay. And uh, I sit down with them. And it's completely patient specific what we end up talking about. Okay. Some patients like literally are drawing their insulin up wrong. Yeah. We have to have like a whole conversation about, yeah. you know, how many units to use. So, oh, yeah, some yeah. patients the are, sub -Q needle yeah, yeah, some are like, you know, well, why can't I have, I'm on insulin. Of course I can eat candy, but you know, so it's like diet. Right. Um, you know, I have some that I talk about exercise, you know, programs and stuff. And, you know, I keep some of that, you know, limited, but like, um, changing medications around. If a patient comes up to me, they're like, look, I, this, I can't take my, my junior V, I take it every day. I don't remember to take it. Um, you know, I want to lose some weight on top of it. It's not really helping with that. Uh, you know, then I'll, I'll switch them to maybe like a once weekly GLP one. Okay. Just working on the same pathway. going to yeah. give you better weight loss. going to give you better A1C control. Yeah. And I'll make that switch, give them a sample. Um, and then the good thing is I can just log back in as a pharmacist next door. Like, cause they're attached in the same building, you run it through their insurance myself. Oh, that's nice. so you know what it'll and be like. Yeah, hey, it's them. covered. Oh, I don't have to like man. let them leave, and I'll just then my technicians will get it ready, and then on the way out the door they can grab it, and it's cool, man. It's a really like just a unique setup that um I'm just super super grateful for. That that is awesome. That is one of the biggest pain in the butts for me too when I'm trying to send a patient home, whether whether it's on like Eliquis or mm -hmm. you know uh, one of the new diabetes meds. It's you really have to check, and that takes a lot of time if you're not, you know, a pharmacist. Like, you finding out if it's covered, I got to call them up, you know. They, like, go send a script. I got to send them a script, and they got to check. And they're like, oh, yeah, they'll have to pay this much. Didn't download the app Formulary. Okay. It's called Formulary. Um, you can put in yeah, no. the uh, the drug name. You put in, like, uh, if, you, if you're, if you like, it'll ask for your region. So you put in, like, South Carolina. It'll say, do you want to see commercial plans? Um, you know, you want to see uh, Medicare plans? Do you want to see Medicaid plans? And you can, uh, I mean, it's not 100% accurate, but it's pretty darn close. So, like, let's say I have a patient who's on Humana Medicare Part D. Okay. I can scroll through the, the Medicare Part D plans with the drug I'm looking for, like Entresto, really? let's say. Say the, there's Humana Part D, click it, and it'll say, like, preferred. Um, it'll be a, a third tier with a PA, like, if you get a prior authorization. Yeah. Like, it'll tell you what you need or what the restrictions That's are. amazing. It's a cool app, man. I use it a lot even now. That's amazing. I, I need that. It's a, it's a free app. Yeah. It's Yeah, download it's, that joker. Because there's no worse than when I discharge a patient 
think I got everything set up, and then I get a call from the pharmacy. Oh, well, it's two hundred dollars, and they're not paying for it. Yeah, they left. They went home. Yeah, they have AFib, and they need anticoagulation. They went home. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh shoot! Why they, did you let them leave? <laughs> right, and if they have like an allergy to Coumadin, and now what? I got to give them Lovenox shots, which are like a thousand dollars. Yeah, it's if ridiculous. You don't have the insurance. Yeah, craziness. But yeah, man, um, that that app has saved me quite a bit of headache sometimes. Gl- wow, I'm glad I came here, man. I just, I, I'm <laughs> telling you, that is one of the biggest pain in the butts. I, I yeah. can't imagine. I mean, like, that'd be so frustrating. Especially, like you said, you think you got them straight. Yeah. And they leave and you're yeah. like, shoot. Yeah, and then you're like, they're going to, and then if they don't come back to the hospital in two days to be admitted again, you're like, what happened to them? You know, I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, that's got to be... Well, and then, you know, the pharmacies now are so, especially the retail pharmacies, are so ridiculously overworked that they may not even take the time to call you to let you know it's not covered. They may send a fax that may or may not get to you. Are they that overwhelmed? Oh my gosh, dude. What's I, your shifts like? I mean, the shifts are, you know, anywhere from eight regular eight hour shifts to like 14 hour shifts, but there's just, it's the, the retail is so change in retail pharmacy. Like as far as innovation is almost non-existent. Really? Um, seeing it firsthand there, you know, the big drug companies would say, no, of course not. We're doing all these, uh, it's, it's, you know, all they care about is metrics. They want these, n- I remember I used to get in trouble, um, you know, with with my job at the in the retail setting for you know like I'd see ten thousand. We have ten thousand people come to the pharmacy, literally mm-hmm. like over ten thousand. We I have twelve people fill out a receipt survey who were pissed off about their med being too expensive, or they thought they called it in and you know the doctor never sent it, so it's my fault. And they would fill out a bad receipt, and then I'd get a lecture from my boss who was not a pharmacist, oh telling me like I need to improve my NPS score and all this. And I'm like, did well, what about Whoa. the what about the patient that I came in on my day, weekend off to like bring meds to at their house because she's elderly and she can't drive? What about the patients I ordered diabetes education material for and yeah. sat out there and went over it with her even though I didn't have time to do that? Like, yeah, even though we had a line. Does, down that, that, does that count just because she didn't fill out a receipt survey? I'm like, I I wouldn't fill out a receipt a, a I survey. Was yeah. Even then, I probably wouldn't. I know, I know. I would have to be seriously upset. Yeah, like Chick Fil A sends has like a yes or no button, and you get a free sandwich. And I'm still just like, nah, it's not the move. <laughs> I'm like, I don't have time for that. I can I click a button. One hundred percent. I'm like, why? This, our survey would take. I did it like one time, like myself with my prescription to see how long it was. It was ten freaking minutes long, and I'm like. You would have to right? be, I would be not even mad anymore no. by the time I got into the survey. <laughs> yeah, I'd be mad at the I'd survey. Like, I, yeah. Where's the survey for the survey? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, it was just unbelievable. So it's just stuff like that yeah. that it completely took away from me being able to actually help patients. It's it, sad, man. It's really sad because there's a lot of is. really good people in retail and they just, they're... It's like mm, burnt out. Yeah, oh, just because they're they are not even, they're, there's no respect, there's no... Um, and actually it's not like a blanket statement. There's definitely no. man, district managers and, and area managers that they have a lot of respect and, and are very good people, but there's a lot that don't, and they, they're just metric driven. Yeah. They have no idea. Like the, the bedside manner doesn't mean anything to them because they're not a healthcare professional. Right. Yeah. And it's just, it's hard. I'm sure the hospitals and stuff have to deal with some of that too, but I mean, yeah, it's, it's brutal, man. I'm, I can't. You know, I won't go into too much and talk too much crap, but geez. No. Yeah, it sounds like underappreciated overwork. It's but, not a good recipe. And, you know, it comes like it stems into things like not calling the provider to let them know. And you don't know. You assume they got it. Yeah. They never come back. It's it just eventually it's going to implode. Yeah. And, you know, that's why people are like really radically hoping for some change it's probably going to be in the in the guise of like different um organizations whether that's like amazon or something like kind of rising up and like recalibrating how everything is done yeah um but i don't see the current state of the retail environment for pharmacists is not going to be here it can't it's not sustainable i don't i would i would give it 10 years max before it's gone what do you think will replace it? I think one, I think like robots will replace the filling part. Yeah, yeah, we can yeah. do that now. And yeah. um, I think that uh, pharmacists will have to go to clinical spaces and, and fill in at different hospitals and doctors, like I more think that'd be great. primary care doctors offices are starting to utilize them. Yeah. Once we, if you know, once and you know, if we get provider status, that'll open up a whole nother realm. So yeah. I, I just think that uh, it's going to have to change, but that comes back to, well, you have a farm D, are you just, literally going to work and then that's it. You just come home and you chill and you freaking watch Netflix and you do all your stuff because you, you've already put in your time. Well, when that hits the fan, there's going to be so many people who are like, oh my geez, like what do I do now? Right? Yeah, because they haven't they looked haven't, up anything for right, 20 like, years. Like, like there's, new, there's all the new drugs. Like, I don't have any of them work. I don't know how to start meds. You know, there's so many people. Yeah. 
I they, haven't sat down with a patient in 10 years. Yeah. Right? It's like, like just yell pushing, at people. I've been throwing, pushing a button and yeah. like, yeah, that's right. That's the right direction. There's no interactions there. Yeah. Like they know that side of it and that'll always be there to an extent. Mm-hmm. Um, but it won't be like it is now where like that's a huge majority. I mean, MUSC and stuff, they're already like retail pharmacy. Something they look at is kind of like if you know, if you're not going to do the normal stuff, you can kind of do that. But it's not even like in a bad way. It's just like, you know, of course you should do a residency. Yeah. Like, specialize. Like, yeah. You need yeah. to know, you know, have, keep your options open. And yeah, it's a. I think that would be a huge help though. Oh, that would be so nice with clinics out there, you know, ran by pharmacists. I mean, it'd be so nice to be able to send patients there or, you know, or them just to come by because they're, you know, they get sent home on these meds or they run out of their diabetes meds and they could walk in and you could teach them, tell them, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That would be huge versus them sitting at home waiting for their sugar to be a thousand and then walking into the ER because they're in decay, something like mm-hmm. that. They, they run smoking. There's pharmacists. I know they run smoking cessation clinics. I mean, all kinds of That's different great. things are utilizing them for. Good. Cause then, and that frees you guys up to do what you guys do best. Cause yeah. I can't go in there and start running. Oh, I need to check this and all these different diagnostics. I don't know that stuff. Yeah. But if they have the diagnosis, right? Yeah. yeah. Th- and that's where you and I work as a team. Like, okay, this is what's going on. This is what needs to happen. And then I can come up with meds while you go on to the next patient. Yeah. And now everyone's getting treated with two different sets of eyes, two different specialties. Yeah. It's better for the patient. Right? And but then I get to ask does, questions does, about meds. And I get to ask questions about why the heck is this guy, why are you raising his arm up right yeah, now? Yeah, <laughs> what does that yeah. have to do with anything? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good, I mean, that that I, gives me hope for the future. Well, And I think like kind of what we started off saying originally like, you know, like 30 minutes ago, like <laughs> when you start that interprofessional relationship, that's truly what it is. Like the, there's so much ego in, in medicine in general, looking and putting like aside, you know, this person's a nurse. They only went to school for maybe four years and I went to school for eight years. doesn't matter. No. Like having that mutual respect, like they have a skill set that you don't have. Right. So where they, I don't care if you went to school for a hundred years and they had no something you didn't, then you need to respect that skill set. Dietitians, um, respiratory therapists, dentists, whatever, everyone has their role and I think if you can come, and I see this with pharmacists all the time, because we're still kind of like clawing, like prove ourselves. <laughs> Some of the students are like, we're the drug experts. You know, I, this doctor is so dumb. Look what he prescribed. I'm like, that's the wrong attitude. Yeah. Like nobody is going to listen to you if you start attacking them to show them how smart you are. And you could tell immediately when you talk to somebody, if they're almost like, right? A you jerk. Get, yeah. Yeah. You're like, all right, well, I, it's almost like you're like, well, I'm going to prescribe it now because I don't, yeah. don't want to listen to this. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm the provider. Yeah. And, and that's what I try to tell students. I'm like, if you and I are working together, I would not, if we didn't know each other, I'm not going to come to you and be like, Tom, listen, I'm the farm D here. Um, let me explain to you why you did all these things wrong. I would say, look, um, here's some suggestions. If you don't want to do it, you're the provider at the end of the day, it's going on your name. What do you think about this? Right. I, I would be so, I'd be like, oh, thank you. Oh my God. I didn't know that. I didn't know about that study. I didn't know that they had this, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I'm so busy. I didn't get to see that their GFR mm-hmm. was this, you know, thank you for catching that. And the more times that you come to me or I come to you and we have a good discussion and like the patient gets treatment, you're going to start to trust me more. More so than like if I just came up to you and I'm like wearing a white coat. Yeah, you, I mean, I could be some moron who like freaking cheated on all my tests and got licensed and you don't know that. And so like I think there's so many young pharmacists, pharmacy students that are so set on proving themselves, which is I get. And I'm super competitive like that. Like when someone talks to me like I'm a moron or well, like yes. you're 30 years old, dude, what are you talking about? Like my first reaction is immediately, like, I'll show you what I know. <laughs> but like you got to stifle that and be like, Yo, look, you got to prove yourself. Like letters after your name doesn't mean crap. Like I'm a firm believer in like you've got yeah. to prove right? yourself. I mean, uh, yeah, a PA fresh out of school versus a, a nurse who's been working the ICU for 10 years. A hundred percent. Right. He could do his job 10 times over. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I, mean. I think that that having that humility to like no, going in, knowing that like, okay, no one is going to take me seriously. I have to prove myself and, and being so super respectful, trying to learn maybe that physician who's doing something you think may be stupid because it was in the textbook wrong yeah. may have some amazing evidence because they've done 20 years of clinical experience and you don't know what the freak you're talking about right? yet. And then you get made look to look really stupid. And, uh, yeah, I just think the humility part of it, I think is so huge. I, students. I can't tell you how many times I would be like to a specialist, like, I'm curious, why are you doing mm-hmm. that? And just, they would hit me with so much, you know, fresh, not, I was like, whoa, okay, you know, you learn something new and that's totally the way to go about your job. But, and, and the other side of that is maybe you hit them with something and they're like impressed. Well, I heard that, yeah. And now they're all of a sudden they're coming to you. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've had that yes. happen to me before too. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, this kid's not 
dumb. Yes, yeah, right? Because you get somebody who's a neurologist for 20 years, oh and you gosh. got this young kid sitting yeah. next to him. But oh, like, he's going to tell me about neurology? Yeah, yeah. 100%. Yeah, like, I'm curious why you did that. I saw in this study, they're like, whoa, you know. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. You want to, and like, you know, there's, and there's always going to be jerks in every yeah. area. Yes. Um, there's always going to be ego, but like, if you can stifle that, like, I think as a student, man, that's so important. 100%. Yeah, that's yeah. my biggest advice. Yeah, and then learn every day. That's the that's the hashtag I use on my Instagram post. Yeah. I think that's so important. I, you know, I, and I would have some advice for nurses out there. I would say if you're going to do anything, go through nurse practitioner school because you can. PA school is great, but you got to you can't work full time. You know, mm-hmm. so I, I would. And I think maybe if I did have to do it again, I might have been a nurse at first because the experience you get. Because when I was a PA, the first time I did a clinical. It was my first time walking mm-hmm. around. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's a good point. Like sticking my stethoscope on a bit, you know. So there's two. There's like a pro and con. So if you're becoming a nurse practitioner, you're already so comfortable with patients, terminology, hospital settings. So you could work full time as a nurse, graduate, and you're already comfortable there. But they, as a PA, you get taught from the very beginning how to look at everything from a physician's point of view like a diagnosing Mm -hmm. you know and then that nurse practitioners tell me that's the thing they're missing because it's hard for them to adjust once they become the nurse practitioner how not to look at them like a nurse and how to look at them as Mm -hmm. you know in the diagnostic type of view so yeah those are the pros and cons i would say of them but i mean whatever you choose you'll be fine there is no difference otherwise pa mp you give them a couple years work they're the same thing Mm -hmm. and if you're 22 years old and you're like well if i have to spend two extra years in school like i'll be old i remember like when i was 20 21 i thought 30 was i was finished like i was done right and and now i'm 30 and i'm like shoot because you're 30 also right yeah i'm 33 33 okay so like yeah i I remember like more energy now i feel like than i did when i was 20 and more motivation like for like especially my career so i'm like i look back at these kids like oh, i can't do this extra year to become this or to get this experience like what are you talking about like what do you think you're like right that was one of the things i was like thinking about med school i'm like well i don't want to graduate when i'm 30 uh, you know finally finish residency (laughs) Now you and realize I'm you're like, 30. Jesus. Like, oh, yeah. yeah, I would have been a surgeon. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, I'm young as crap. Yeah. yeah. And um, at least I feel young. Maybe yeah. I don't look young, but yeah. like, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I just think that uh, people just, when you're 20, you feel like 30. Yeah. So, um, man. And I'm sure, like, when I'm 40, I hope I'm saying, like, well, I can't believe when I was 30, I thought, you know, yeah. I had done something. Right. <laughs> yeah. You thought your, yeah, your life would be very, like on the track. You're all done with everything. Yeah. Um, no. I just, be- I just want to clarify that PA school is amazing. Yeah. I love what I do. And what I mean is, if you're going to go through a PA school, my recommendation would be getting a job like an EMT. Mm-hmm. Or you know some something to do with patients because I, ha- I had zero of that. Um, you know I did my shadowing hours, but that doesn't help much. Uh, it just kind of shows you what you'll be doing. But if you really work a job like an EMT or something like that, it helps you so much being used to dealing with patients, putting your hands on them, you know, doing kind of stethoscope, physical, talking to them in their, you know, because they're in very vulnerable situa- situations, probably the most vulnerable in their life. Mm-hmm. Um, so that would be my big recommendation. That was probably my regret. So if you're going to go to PA school, which is amazing, either one, I love PA school because it taught you to look at things in that diagnostic view. But I, I didn't have that experience. And if I had to do it again, I would probably would have like become an EMT on like nights while I was in undergrad or mm-hmm. during the summer or something like that. Get that experience. Yeah. You know, and I mean, talk about experience, right? You're using mm-hmm. these major drugs, you know, for people in these insane situations and you'll walk into, you'll be so much more comfortable because yeah. I can't tell you how bad my hand shook the first time I, <laughs> I took somebody's blood pressure. Oh, or, I can imagine. I just, the whole time I'm like, they know I don't know what I'm doing. They know <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> Dude, and, and the last thing I'll say so we can wrap up, but like, um, we take, I feel like something weird happens. Like when we're in undergrad, like we have no problem volunteering to shadow when we're in pharmacy school or PA school or medical school, we spend money to work for free because right. you're in, on rotations and like doing all this stuff. Medical school, you have two years of clinical rotations. Yeah. You spend all this money and all this time. We think of like volunteering and like, cause there's a learning opportunity. And then all of a sudden something weird happens. Like you finish school and you're like, volunteer, no way. I'm you're supposed to be right. getting paid to yeah. do this. I'm worth, what are you talking? Like people forget what they did to get to where they're at. That's a great point. I have no problem as, you know, no, I don't care how many letters I have after my name. I have no problem volunteering right now at some clinic that I think 
it doesn't have to be a lot of time. I work full time and I would still volunteer to like, maybe that's how I got involved with some of the experience with teaching before I was ever even in peace. Teaching peace school is not on my radar. Yeah. Ever. Right. Yeah. I would volunteer at the, at the medical university at the pharmacy school and like get some experience talking to students, get some experience kind of like explaining things to students and, uh, completely on my own time. But that gave me like a foundation to then, it was very easy for me to transition. You know, I shouldn't say very easy, but I was able to transition yeah. into this role of like actually being like an adjunct professor, um, as ridiculous as I felt like that was for me like, to do. I'm a professor. Yeah. Like, yeah. like this is, there's got to, somebody messed up something somewhere. Yeah. And, uh, you, you know, because of that volunteer and, and like people get this idea of like, well, I'm, I've been practicing for five years. Why would I volunteer to like, that is a great to, view, man. It, it I'm cannot, telling you. Yeah. And most of the time you won't have to volunteer. Most of the time you'll probably get paid for like something extra you pick up, but you're almost still not doing it. Like I already work full time. I don't need to take this other job. Well, I'll learn something amazing from a totally different view. I, and, but you're so right. And I really never thought of that. That is so true. Right. All of a sudden you're like, how dare I volunteer? Yeah. Like, how dare I go learn something else? It's, yeah, yeah. It's like that ego. Like you just have that instilled. Right. Like everyone has that instilled. Like, no, no, you're so important. And cause you got to build that confidence, but you also got to have the humility to realize I'm not, I'm only as good as my last at bat. Yeah. You know, I'm, you know, I don't, this is an area that I want to work in. Like somebody asked me right now, like, well, how, if you moved out of Charleston and people don't know who you are anymore, how would you like get a job at a hospital? Let's say you didn't do a residency. Like one, I'm, I'm working now to get my board certifications and things that I would normally do step one step two even if i didn't have that i would start volunteering for i don't care if i'm the guy wheel wheel channeling people out to their vehicles i would do that and start to get to know people in the hospital on my days off to kind of work my way in get to know the nurses bring them cookies bring the front desk people that trickles up and i'd start volunteering for helping out with students whatever i could until finally someone's like this guy's cool to have around. He's useful. Maybe he knows some stuff and show my worth. Like I, going in there with my, with my CV and being like, uh, you should probably hire me. And by then they know you or you can right. be like, oh, I asked Dr. So-and-so, mm -hmm. you know, he's one of my references. And like, oh, how do you know him? Mm -hmm. And that guy's like, oh, he's always around on his time off volunteering. <laughs> That's a great advice, man. If uh, Everybody should listen to that because... It's unbelievable the way you network and build bridges if you do things like that. I just, and people just don't realize, man. They don't realize how small the world of medicine is. Yeah. And it's like, if you, and if you volunteer for four months and nothing happens, that's four months. You went to school for years right? to get to where you're like, keep going. Like Your career will be probably 30, 40 years. Like, yeah, trust me, four months. You'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, you get four months, so you won't even remember it in 10 right. years. Especially if it turns and manifests into this, you know, great yeah. opportunity. I, yeah. I just can't stress that enough. I believe in that so much. Yeah, and you know, practice in medicine, there's going to be days when you want to throw your stethoscope in the trash because mm -hmm. you have bad patients or you do the wrong thing or maybe you look stupid. And then there's going to be days where you you know, see a patient after somebody else and you pick up this one symptom where you order this one test and you're going to think you're amazing. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be good and bad days. And I'm not going to lie. My first job was so busy and crazy that I was questioning my career choice. I was like, wow, is this what I'm just going to have to do? And then I went out there and I took some other jobs and I couldn't be happier. And I can't tell you how nice it is to drive to work happy. Yes. Like not stressed out, not wanting like a meteor to come crashing <laughs> to my car because I'm like, I'd rather that than go to work for another 15 hour shift. You don't want to get yeah. there. So don't get discouraged if you have a bad day or you take a job, stick it out. Or a bad month. Yeah. Or a bad a month. Bad year yeah, even. bad three years. Um, but I mean, I can't, it, those three years were really rough, but I came out such a better practitioner that, you know, it's, it's worth it. So stick through it and I promise it'll be worth it. Find the good. Yeah. Hey, I'm sorry that we didn't. We talk, uh, I didn't get to talk much about a subject, but next time I'm here. No, this was good, man. I appreciate yeah. it. This was fun. Yeah, I guess. I kind of forgot we recorded. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, man, this is my first time, but this was great. It was kind of last minute, but I'm so glad I did this. Heck yeah. Um, awesome, man. Well, we'll have you back. We'll do, we'll have you on. We'll have like a yeah. case study and have you on and get some of your expertise on the, do run through a case. That'd be uh, fun. That'd we'll be do, amazing. Let's do it soon. Yeah, man. All right. All right, brother. Well, thank you for taking the time. Um, thank you guys for listening. I know that was a long one, but um, if you have any questions, uh, reach out to me. I'll be happy to put you in contact with Tom. I'm sure he uh, would be okay with uh, answering some questions here and there for uh, students or potential students. Absolutely. Um, if you love the podcast, uh, please leave me uh, and call a rating and you know let us know um, that you listen. We would really appreciate that. That means a lot to us whenever um, you know we see the, some of the feedback. Um, if you have any other concerns or maybe you hate the podcast, send me an email. I'd rather you not leave me 
a rating, but <laughs> send me that uh, that email and let us know so we can improve because we, we're still very, very, very early in uh, kind of getting through this. So we want to improve and make sure it's beneficial for everyone taking the time to listen. Thank you guys so much, and I'll see you next time. Later. Take care.